Well, all right, this is InfoSec Decoded 44, and I guess we'll call it Bitcoin. El Salvador, by 7 September, is going to switch to Bitcoin. The problem is, of course, that people don't have cell phones. They don't have networks. There's no payment system that works, as anybody could have told him. Bitcoin is currently quite unusable for normal transactions. It takes an hour to resolve the transaction. The transaction fee is several dollars. They've got Lightning Network planned, but they haven't figured out how to do that. So he's promised to make everybody pay for everything in Bitcoin when there is no actual way to do that at all. So they're scrambling to come up with something that they can pretend will actually be uh, Bitcoin by 7 September. So we'll see what this turns into. It sounds like another uh, poorly thought out disaster in the cryptocurrency space. And then Liz has got, oh, Putin is going to stop ransomware. He doesn't know that we stopped it ourselves last week. But anyway, go ahead. Right. Well, you know, just so because we wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be a day that ends in Y without um, a stupid news story about ransomware. I felt like I had to do my part today. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, the, this is just a brief little blurb that covers a, um, discussion that uh, Biden and Putin allegedly had about ransomware and how they're going to coordinate and uh, tackle this uh, horrible problem together. And that uh, if, if these hackers keep being naughty, the United States might hack back. So, you know, I heard a good um, podcast from Nicole Perwath where she said more clearly than anybody I'd heard, the reason why we keep doing this, we threaten to hack back and then we don't because they say, well, what would happen then? And what would happen then is we have 10 times the vulnerable targets. And when they retaliate from that, we will just end up worse than we are now. And that's what holds right. us back every time. We're like the guy in the glass house that doesn't want to start throwing stones. Well, we, they made a committee about it and they'll have meetings about it. And as we know, that's what it takes to solve the problem. Well, yeah, yeah. You have to have a meeting about the meeting to talk about the meeting. Yeah. That's, that's how problems that's, are solved. That's key. And usually, and if you don't have a meeting about the same thing six times, then it's not government. So. Okay. I think you people have figured it out. All right. <laughs> Caitlin. <laughs> that's in a nutshell. That's the answer to how do we get rid of ransomware? Yes. We have to have a meeting about that. You know, well, I meetings mean, and asteroids. Oh, I remember Donald Trump did the same thing. He said, we're going to cooperate with the Russians and work together to secure our elections. And it, it made a similar amount of sense. It worked out really well in practice, too. You can see how well it worked. Our elections were, in fact, the most secure they've ever been. Although some people don't believe that. Anyway, um, Caitlin is going to disintegrate plastic. Yes, we're going to start dis disintegrating plastic, uh, hopefully. Uh, one of the big environmental issues we face after global warming is our trash. Uh, everyone is should be aware by now that there's a giant floating island of plastic in the Pacific. And finding a way to disintegrate uh, this plastic faster would be great for the environment. And there's already a few plastics that, that do disintegrate over time. I'm thinking in particular uh, PLA, uh, polylactic acid type plastics, which do break down over time, but you need a you know, professional composting situation set up. Uh, this new plastic uh, outlined in New Atlas News um, by Nick uh, Lavars. Yes, by Nick Lavars. Uh, talked about a new type of plastic um, that will apparently uh, break down under the sun, which is really good if it's floating on top of the ocean, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really hoping to see, see how this works. And I, and you know, one of the things about plastics is, of course, that it is designed to be exposed to the sun and to contain things. So it'll be interesting to see how uh, this plastic will be able to be used, um, like whether or not we'll have to start wrapping plastic in paper to make sure it doesn't disintegrate when it gets exposed to UV light or whatever. But, you know, I'm very happy to see these advancements happening. Yeah, there's quite a bit of plastic can't handle the sun. I know that's why all the electric cables have to have that thick black stuff. The other right. plastic can't handle the sunlight. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. And Irvin has the answer. Release the PCAPs. Um, no, not an answer, but uh, 
following a story. Yeah. Uh, my pillow guy said that he had the PCAPs and was calling all the CISSPs to action and whatnot. Yeah. Well, uh, he said PCAP, and that piqued the interest of none other than Laura Chapel herself. Yeah, the PCAP expert. The PCAP expert herself. Uh, so she's been asking him to show these so-called PCAPs that he has. Uh, he's so been calling good. them. She's been. Yeah. She even joined that that new Twitter thing from them. What I didn't that? know they had one, but yeah. Um, what is that? That new platform that they made. Oh, yeah, like uh, an imitation Twitter. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. She joined even that to try yeah. to get to, to my pillow guy and get, and have him release these PCAPs. Well, the video he put out did have screenshots of the PCAPs, and you could see that they weren't the PCAPs at all. They were just CSV files in ASCII. So if he does release the PCAPs, it would certainly help greatly in debunking this whole thing. As if anybody, but I don't think anybody on that side cares about the truth. So, but anyway, uh, but Laura, anyway, it, it has, I, I enjoy what Laura's shenanigans. Oh yeah. And, and it's just been fun watching uh, her <laughs> go after and publicly say, okay, here I am yeah. you know, basically willing to give my, my expertise pro bono, like give me the info. Yeah. Well, she is the real expert. Yes. But I, but I don't think she'll get anything but abuse from those people for saying the PCAPs aren't any good. Yeah. Boa, well, it's fun to watch. All right. And Alan has the Great Firewall. Yes, the Great Firewall. A group of academics from four different universities have together published a paper titled, How Great is the Great Firewall? Measuring China's DNS Censorship. And it's quite an interesting analysis. They really went in depth. They created a system that they call GF Watch that's able to access domains both inside and outside of China's uh, internet and then measured uh, just how much DNS tampering was taking place. And uh, what they found out was pretty interesting. First of all, they, they, they tested over half a billion different domains. And of those accessed a little more than 400 million of those domains every single day, just to verify that these blocks were um, uh, recurring. And what they found was that the, the so-called Great Firewall is blocking around 300,000 domains um, consistently. And of those, maybe 270,000 or so are intentional blocks whereas the remaining 41,000 have been blocked by accident. Yeah. And these Quite accidental well blocks are pretty interesting in that it appears to be an issue with regex. Yeah. And that the, the DNS filtering is taking place because the regex is a little too open-ended. And so it's blocking domains such as um, uh, cached, reddit.com and books reddit.com because those domains happen to contain reddit.com even though they're entirely separate from the reddit well you um, have to do that to maintain performance you can't have too complicated rules i suppose not yeah i mean considering the volume of internet traffic in china i suppose they, they have to do what they can um so at any rate um it seems that a lot of these domains that are getting blocked are newly registered domains. And so um, there's like a, a period in which these newly registered domains have to mature, so to speak, until they can be verified and then whitelisted. Right, that's what I would think. Government. Just like you, someone has to review it and rate it. And, and Yeah, so there to... might be a human that... review element in this. Oh, I, I would assume there is, yes. Um, but of the, the websites that are clearly, or domains that are clearly being blocked intentionally, um, th there are things like pornography, um, certain social media sites, uh, gambling sites, personal blogs, news and media, and uh, malicious uh, content. Yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty big mix of different things. Yeah. Um, there was a study like this a few years ago that showed that uh, they're blocking, in fact, a bunch of 
connections outside China. Yeah, and, and this, this uh, uh, study confirmed that also, that some of these DNS blocks are getting propagated elsewhere. Right. Uh, and so they're ended up, and ending up blocked um, well outside of China too. Yeah, the whole philosophy of DNS caching does not consider censorship, which sort of messes up the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, it's good to see people analyzing it. And, and last night, I learned about the CWE list, not the CVE list, but the CWE list, which is the common weakness enumeration. And the difference between a weakness and a vulnerability is a weakness is a coding error that might lead to a vulnerability. So it starts with improper neutralization of input and then improper restrictions of operations within the bounds of a memory buffer and so on. And uh, this apparently is another way to look at it. I've been getting quite interested in the attack framework and now the defense framework that goes with it. And this is another one. All these I think are big steps forward in security as we begin to make taxonomies of listing all the problems and then rating the problems and trying to you know, create usable security metrics. So anyway, I'll probably have to throw this in my classes somewhere, things people should know about. And uh, then Liz, who may or may not exist, I think she exists, has got- uh, I'm here. Okay, an office flaw. Yeah, just sorry, just juggling a few, yeah. juggling a few things here. So um, this is pretty interesting. Um, and it's, it's something that is gonna affect a lot of folks, even though um, it's only, an attacker would need physical access to carry uh, out this attack. But uh, the um, it's pretty interesting because uh, I've, I've actually met these researchers before and they've been really kind of passionately dedicated to finding flaws in Cisco phones for quite a while. And uh, they certainly found a good one with this. Um, and in fact, it, it uh, affects uh, many different models. Uh, I believe it was like 13 or something like that, uh, different models of Cisco phones. And uh, this is an issue that can't be fixed with a patch, easily fixed with a patch because um, there is a vulnerable AI uh, API, um, vulnerable API associated with um, one of the uh, Broadcom chips that uh, is used in the phone. So uh, the firmware is, uh, is a problem here and it's not, not super easy to uh, patch or update these. Now um, to exploit it, an attacker would need, like I said, physical access and would have to remove the back plate of the phone. But you know, I'm sure many of us have worked in different uh, enterprise environments where an attack like that would probably be pretty easy to carry out. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it sounds, reminds me of the iPhone flaw based, uh, based on the hardware. Yes, and it's, I mean, the, the thing is too, is the reason that this is interesting is because not so much the individual device itself and the specific vulnerability, but the fact that it's symptomatic of a, a much larger problem um, in enterprise security where uh, you can do what seem like all of the uh, proactive steps for due diligence and still get host because you might have bought a product that had some loans on the firm, firmware and you know it, it's just not possible to protect against everything yeah i think i think we've all had to learn this uh, at first we thought you only got hacked if you were stupid but now there's right. just no choice what happens basically is that the best practices of today are not good enough in three or four years as new attacks come out and you'll never catch up Right. Yeah. All right. And so the only thing you can do is have defense in depth. You just have to expect all kinds of problems to appear and then respond to them. Right. And you also like the metaphor I like too is um, that it's like cleaning your house because companies will ask me like, well, what do we, what all do we have to do before we're secure? Yeah. And like, like you'll, you'll get to this ultimate point where you've done everything you need to do. And it's not like that. It's like cleaning your house. You can't just clean your house once really, really well and expect that it'll just never get dirty again. Yeah, Cause that's, that's not how it works. You have to keep a clean house. You know, you have to continue to 
to clean up messes as they happen and security is much the same way. Yeah, that sounds good, yeah. All right, and this I thought is pretty great. Caitlin found the good side of China's cracking down on crypto. Yes, thank goodness. So one of the problems of recently has been getting GPUs. And this is partly a manufacturing issue, but a large part of it is also just the demand for GPUs in the crypto mining circuit. And actually, Sam, if you remember when we went to the computer store a few weeks ago, they mm -hmm. were actually having raffles for people who wanted to buy video cards. They're that rare. You can't yeah. get a video card <laughs> uh, because they're just being bought up by these, well, uh, there is a shortage just due to technical reasons um, and manufacturing reasons, but there's also a shortage due to people in China buying these graphics cards in bulk to do crypto mining. Mm -hmm. So recently China has put the brakes on crypto mining, probably because I'm guessing they don't control the money. They would, you know, they really making, want to have their- They're making their own government cryptocurrency to replace it. Right, right. They want, they want to have their own control. They don't right. like anything they can't control. So uh, this is going to alleviate a lot of the issues and people can start making computers again. And I felt really bad too, because it's one thing when like you and I, can't build a new computer. It's not that big of a deal. But I have nephews during the pandemic that are starting to get into computers and they wanted more than anything to build a computer. Uh, and they really couldn't uh, because of this GPU shortage. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, good. Affecting education, affecting everyone, so. I know it's cut down the hash rate and made it easier to mine Gitcoin than it's been in years. It really has made a huge difference to nuke all the Chinese Bitcoin miners. All right, and I saw on Newegg mm -hmm. the other day a GPU being sold from China. Well, there you go. There ought to be a lot of them, used ones, I would think. Yeah, they are trying to get rid of them. Yeah, and the new one, and the good news is that you know all, you're going to save money um, buying those used ones because obviously they've been used. Yeah. All right, and Urban's got an AI pair program. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt who was here with us uh, not too long ago in one of our podcasts brought this up where you start typing something and um, and GitHub Copilot takes care of the rest. So it helps fix your syntax the way like uh, Apple spelling check fixes your spelling. Uh, it helps create code, not not so much fix your your syntax, but it helps fill in the blanks. So, so it's uh, Skynet. Kind of, yeah. Taking yeah. in from other GitHub repos yep. to put code in there for you so you don't have to write it all. Yeah, it's, it automates the process of plagiarism. Yes, I absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. No, it sounds <laughs> great, yeah. Not, not being a programmer or even a strong programmer, just a programmer myself, I, I find the, uh, the help sound like such great news. Yeah, yeah. Does it do Python? Yeah. I'm teaching Python tomorrow. Maybe I'll send students here. It's not, it's not, uh, it's in public right now in beta testing. Okay. You have to sign up and okay. wait to get the okay to get it. Oh, okay. I think once this does get fully you know, released to the world, yeah, I'm sticking this everywhere I can because, yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. All right. And Alan's got uh, Gmail with a logo. I don't understand what this is. Well, Gmail is going to look a little bit different when you use it in the near future because you will see company logos in your inbox. And these are actually part of an IETF RFC. They're called BIMIs or Brand Indicators for Message Identification which has actually been around for a few years and it's built on top of DMARC, which is okay. a part of, uh, well, let's say an ongoing effort to uh, cut down on spam and spoofed emails. And it all leverages DNS. So it's very much related to the previous item I was just talking about. But at any rate, uh, these brand indicators for message identification allow senders to associate an image with their, um, with their emails. And so in the future, when you get that email from Bank of America or Wells Fargo, you will see a little Bank of America logo or Wells Fargo logo. And when you see that, you can reliably 
assume that it's from the real bank and not from a spammer who's somehow spoofing an email from one of those. And how do they prevent me from spoofing? Yes, yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, well, that part I don't really know because like all of these email security anti-spoofing measures, it gets pretty complicated and uh, I don't really get it myself. Yeah, because this reminds me of the padlock in the browser, which was supposed yeah. to be the same thing, but then they've just put an image of a padlock on the page. Right. I mean, how, I could just stick an image of an Apple logo on my email, I suppose, but it wouldn't pop up to the right place. I don't know. Anyway, it's not a bad idea, I suppose. No, if it works, it's a great idea. And yeah. it has to be said that DMARC does actually work somewhat. It's not foolproof, but it, yeah. it's definitely an improvement over just SPF, for example. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been very widely implemented, even by rather large organizations. So uh, maybe the branding aspect of this, mm -hmm. just the fact that the logo will appear in your Gmail uh, yeah. will induce companies to start implementing DMARC. Well, I think it might. If, if, if your logo appears and that's a good thing, that's got to be like uh, good advertising for your brand. That's right. Security is advertising or advertising is security. Yeah, makes sense. All right. And so now we got uh, quantum processors. These guys are going to sell quantum processors, Quantware, even though quantum processors so far won't actually do anything. And they'll sell you a quantum processor with, I think, two qubits or five qubits, something like that. And it has to be cooled to liquid helium temperatures but they claim it's 99.9% .9 accurate, which is a comparatively low level of noise. So I don't know what they think anybody is going to do with that thing, but they think there's a market and the market will increase and their product will double in quality every year or something. And that might all be true. This is sort of like uh, Richard Branson, who just made the first tourist trip to space. The, the first one is expensive and pointless, but once you have the first one, then it will expand. So you can buy a quantum processor from these guys pretty soon anyway, for whatever good it may do you. Everybody else has just been sharing a few quantum processors in the cloud, like IBM Q-Wave and G-Wave, whatever they call it. But anyway, uh, there's the first startup that actually wants to sell them to people. Anyway, and Elizabeth has got uh, a $16,000 Tesla repair. Yeah, so... Uh... The moral of this story is that uh, it's it's just a yet another prime example of why uh, consumers' right to repair needs to be protected and uh, codified into law. So this guy uh, basically got the battery pack on his Tesla was damaged by um, hitting some road debris which you'd think it'd be a pretty common problem, especially here around the Bay Area. I see like couches and mattresses, you know, I've seen uh, enormous like 20 gallon pot plants on the freeway. I've seen pieces of cars and trucks and uh, I'm surprised I haven't seen a small child yet because I've seen so many boulders. Uh, I even saw an anvil on the highway once like, <laughs> Wiley Coyote had come through and dropped some of his acne swag on uh, the way to the set. But I would think this would be a very common problem that cars, uh, because that the battery packs would be damaged. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lucrative problem it is too, because this guy was quoted $16,000 to repair the uh, damage to his battery on his car by the Tesla dealership. Only? And, $16,000. And I believe he thought that was a little uh, high of a quote mm -hmm. and figured out that he could um, have his problem repaired at an independent repair shop for a grand total of $700, um, which is pr a pretty egregious difference. And, uh, you know, we see this, we see this all the time. In fact, I just um, just a few days ago, I helped a friend um, repair his laptop for about uh, a quarter of the price that he was quoted to get it done at Apple at the Genius Bar. So, yep. Well, that's 
That makes sense. By the way, do you avoid your warranty? I suppose you do if you oh, care about that. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, but at least it's not illegal to fix it, right? Right. And I mean, that's, that is, uh, you know, if, if you haven't voided the warranty, do you really own it? <laughs> that's a true hacker's attitude. All right. And Caitlin's got this uh, couple articles about Kaseya supposedly knew about their flaws. Yeah. So Gizmodo has an article written by uh, Elise Stanley uh, talking about Kaseya and what they knew before the ransomware attack. So uh, between 2017 and, and 2020, a bunch of report, a bunch of employees apparently said that they were really concerned about some of the cybersecurity at their uh, place of work. Uh, this included things like poor encryption, outdated code, um, and other, you know, things like non-patched software. Uh, so uh, these, apparently these concerns uh, did not go heated. Um, no one heeded the concerns. And so now we're kind of stuck in the situation where uh, they have been targeted as part of a um, supply chain attack. So but they got in with supposedly zero days, like like unnoticed SQL injection. So it's not clear that the stuff that they uh, detected is what mattered. Maybe not. Maybe not. The other thing, um, first, I remember I used to take these stories more seriously until I became the guy complaining about problems. And I realized, I think you could take every company at every time and say there's a bunch of security people at that company matter than hell saying you're not patching stuff right. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. Yep. Anyway. Uh, that will probably uh, affect the lawsuits that will presumably come over this. <laughs> and uh, Urban has OBS being abused. Yes, there is malware named Biopass who's using a rat, remote access trojan, mm -hmm. coded in Python that is utilizing OBS if it's installed and using that to, to send a screen. Is that what if you it's see? installed, well, it's installed on my system. That's rude. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. That's charming. Right. <laughs> okay. And so uh, it's right now they have found that rat disguised as a Flash Player or Silverlight. Yep. Yep. I didn't know it relied on a local installation of OBS. Yeah. But it is. So hey. Well, as long as you don't fall for those those tricks of updating your your flash sam you'll be fine hmm yeah maybe from that one all right and the last one is alan i've got something wrong with master's degrees <laughs> well, there's quite a lot wrong with the education system in general and the wall street journal has this article uh titled financially hobbled for life the elite master's degrees that don't pay off and as a disclaimer, this is coming from the Wall Street Journal, which has taken a hard turn to the right after the Murdoch family purchased the publication. So they yeah. definitely have a few axes to grind and a political agenda to, to further here. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting look at how some schools, uh, in particular elite schools, um, such as Columbia University, which is discussed at length in the article, um, have leveraged in part their brand reputation for charging really exorbitantly high tuition for their graduate programs. And for folks who do not have a graduate degree and have not gone through the student loan process for getting a graduate degree, myself included actually, um, graduate loans, student loans are often issued at far worse terms than undergraduate loans. Oh, man. They typically have higher interest rates. Um, there aren't any subsidies for graduate student loans. Uh, the borrowing limits are higher, so grad students can end up more deeply in debt. Um, and um, it, there are very few grants available to grad students. Um, it seems that the institutions are less interested in lightening the financial burden. Um, so it's a lot easier for grad students to end up with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. It's been a lot of coverage of how like fourth tier law schools are a bad deal, um, but less attention paid to like the MFA programs of 
the world. And so this story goes into depth of, say, the uh, film program, graduate film program at mm -hmm. uh, Columbia University and how students are ending up you know, a quarter of a million dollars in debt with very poor job prospects, or maybe they have okay job prospects, but still very poor earnings because most people do not make much money in the film industry. And uh, it's interestingly enough, a lot of jobs in the film industry do not require you to have a, 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 a undergraduate degree, much less a, a graduate degree. Instead, it's all about connections. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, education is worthless. We're, we're, we're qualified to know this. Yes, right. And as much as a graduate degree is held up as this, I don't know, this brass ring that magically guarantees you a higher income, that is not necessarily the case. And even graduate degrees for a more vocational track, uh, such as, um, say, counseling, don't lead to a very high uh, income possibly ever during your working career. And yet you're still going to possibly a very expensive school. Um, and so it's gonna be very difficult to pay off that loan, especially seeing as there isn't a really loan forgiveness available to grad students the way there is to undergraduate students. Yeah, I, I have a lot of visiting speakers come to my classes and uh, this topic comes up often and they're always sort of shy to admit that they didn't actually get any college degrees to get in the field in tech or security typically. and they don't actually think those degrees are worth anything. And they think I'm going to get mad at them for saying that in my college class, but it's a true fact. A lot of the luminaries in the field have no training in the field at all. So I think DEF CON is one, this is one of the things that DEF CON really slaps you in the face with is these amateurs with no credentials at all are doing awesome stuff. So what exactly makes colleges think they can say you have to take this book and take this test and that's what measures whether you know something. It's, it's not really all that true at all. Yeah, and it has to be said that there are some programs out there with very good security focused uh, master's programs or PhD programs. And so for people who are really interested in doing hardcore research, for example, security related research, some programs uh, really are very valuable. And, and Liz can speak to this. But I've also looked at other programs and um, probably shouldn't name any institutions here, but I have looked at other programs, looked at their course offerings, and it's a total joke. And these are quote unquote, good schools, reputable schools. Oh yeah. Uh, not necessarily very far away from city college. And yet you can see that all they're doing is repackaging some say business school classes. And then they come up with like a Fisher price cybersecurity class or two, and then they're charging maybe a hundred grand for that whole thing or, or more. It's like 50, $70,000 a year. So what are the good ones? Do you know good ones, Liz? Uh, there are, there, it's sort of a spectrum. Some are better than others, but uh, I suspect that Alan and I looked at, the, at a similar um, highly regarded school that's not too far from City College of San Francisco and um, came to a similar conclusion about their uh, security degree. And I mean, this is a top CS school and the program is was just appalling. And, um, you know, I think too, I've heard hiring managers say, well, I have seen people turn up I've seen a manager say, I've seen people turn up that have a master's in cybersecurity yet can't execute uh, a basic command line um, prompt. And I mean, I, I, I uh, believe it from what I've seen from some of these programs. Yeah, well, I, I, would expect, unfortunate. Well, I would expect Carnegie Mellon to be pretty good. Yes, they're yeah. doing some really cool research. Um, I have uh, heard good things about um, uh, what is it? Uh, university? Uh, it's it's a uh, Dakota State. Uh, I've heard good yeah. things about Dakota State, um, and their team often does well in the um, in the, the competitions yeah. and uh, and I think Central know, Florida, right? University of Central Florida also always always one of the top schools. 
in Stanford. Well, they don't have a dedicated cybersecurity master, so. Well, they, they have a great team, but I guess they don't have the curriculum yeah. to back it up. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think the point is that brand name doesn't necessarily count for much in, in the way of quality of cybersecurity master's programs. Yeah. Like um, uh, another school that comes to mind is Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, which oh. is not widely known at all, but they do have some really interesting classes like on FPGA security. And wow. that's probably the only class in the world on FPGA security. Well, that's you know, amazing. This is true yeah. of other fields too, though. You just have to cherry pick your grad school. Each one is good at one thing and not good at another. But, all right. Well, I guess that's it for this one. And it is Monday night. We'll be back on Thursday night.